Welcome to everyone. Anyone here a litigator? <laughs> Anyone here not a litigator? Not involved in litigation? Well, it, you're involved in litigation, but in a different way. So anyone not involved in litigation? OK. Have a look at that. Why do draftsmen not take note of the impact of a clear and consistent line of judicial decisions? Um, a good question, and uh, one I hope to shed some light on, I hope, this evening over the next uh, 45 minutes, 50 minutes or so. Uh, I was, uh, came across this when I was researching my, my book on contractual indemnities, and uh, there was a, came across another couple of Court of Appeal decisions, and they were both on exactly the same clause in a shipbuilding contract, exactly the same clause. When you read it, it the wording is obviously defective, and the first time it went to the Court of Appeal, they uh, rubbished it. And the second time it went to the Court of Appeal, the judges were musing, saying, why is it a contract, a template contract, that's used for very large, high-value transactions is obviously still doing the rounds, even though the Court of Appeal has said this is rubbish? Um, why, why is it we do that? It's because humans copy. And I was reading an article in um, something reputable, I think it was New Scientist, and it was about, uh, and it introduced the story, its article, with a story about an American scientist. Don't worry, I'm not going to try and do a, an American accent. And, um, and she was cooking um, dinner for an old friend of hers. And the friend said, this roast ham recipe you do is fantastic. I've always enjoyed this roast ham. But I've always meant to ask you, why do you trim the ends off the ham before you put it in the oven? Well, said the scientist, it's, uh, I learned this recipe at my mother's knee. It's a great recipe. It, it, you know, this enhances the flavor of the ham. And it's a great recipe. And afterwards, she thought, well, actually, I'm a scientist. And I know for a fact that trimming the ends off the ham isn't going to enhance the flavor of the meat. That's rubbish. So she rang her mother. And she said, Mum, why did you teach me to trim the ends off the ham on that ham recipe? And her mother said, that's what my mother taught me. I've always done this. You know, it's a great recipe. Everybody's always liked it. It's been a fantastic success. Uh, so it enhances the flavor of the meat. So anyway, the scientist went away and thought a bit more. So she rang her grandmother. And she said, um, Grandmother, why did you teach my mother to trim the ends off the ham on that ham recipe? And her grandmother said, um, I never did that. I never taught her that. And she said, hang on, I remember now, she said. I remember. We arrived in New York and we were so poor, we couldn't afford a roasting tin big enough to get the ham in. <laughs> so that's why I trimmed the ends off the ham to get it in the oven. But what the article was saying was that uh, human beings, it, it's in, innate to mankind, that we copy and we slavishly copy. And what the article was trying to do is compare us with, say, chimpanzees. And no matter how cute they look with the, when they get a stick and they use it as a tool, they're saying, actually, chimpanzees uh, learn tricks by themselves. They don't copy. It's human beings that copy. And it was saying that one of the reasons, perhaps, for mankind's evolution is because we are able to copy and by copying, we just take things as a, as a basis, a firm basis. And then we can build on top of that basis and keep going forward. And I think nowhere is that truer in our own uh, legal profession where we slavishly copy and we just take uh, templates. And when I give a, a training, half-day training course I do for juniors or trainees on how to draft commercial contracts, and they say, well, how many times have you um, drafted a contract from scratch? And, you know, it's hands down, they never have. I said, well, how do you start a contract? And they say, well, it's PLC or it's LexisNexis, it's Fast Draft or it's, you know, I got the firm template. And, and I say, do you know where the expression cut and paste comes from? And they will invariably say Microsoft. And I say, it's not, it's not Microsoft because when I was a lad, uh, when you, I did a contract, um, I couldn't go to Butterworth's Encyclopedia of Forms and Precedents and then cut out the pages. I couldn't do that. I spent a lot of my life standing over a hot photocopier, if you remember those, and just copying out whole pages and then of different contracts and then sticking them with a print stick onto a bit of card paper. And then you had to go through it all and with a red pen cross out all the terms because you couldn't have a contract with referring to the customer and the user and the licensee and the client. Then it had to be, then the secretary had to type it all out. Then you had to go through it over and over again, weeding out the inconsistencies and the typos. They were better days, really. <laughs> So uh, Sam asked me to talk about uh, boilerplate, something we slavishly copy. As he said in the int introduction, it's something many commercial lawyers just take for granted. It's there. 
in the contract. It hardly gets looked at. Um, when it comes to reviewing a contract as a commercial lawyer, I know by the time you've got to clause 50, the eye is glazing over and you don't tend to notice that, that bad news hidden in the force majeure clause. So what is, what is um, uh, boilerplate? And I, I drew up a list of what I think could be considered boilerplate. Um, you could probably think of others. But you may question whether some of those are boilerplate anyway. Um, and I thought, well, I've got 45 minutes to speak or whatever. Um, so I could spend two minutes on each sort of like entire agreement clause. The problem with that is this. Um, uh, change of control, the problem is this. And I thought that would probably be uh, not such a good idea. So I thought what I'd do is, um, I, many of you probably have known me from my update on contract law, which I do for the Society for Computers and Law. Uh, and I thought what I'd do is, is go back through certain sections of it over the years and try and draw out some themes on these particular areas uh, and focus on them. But they're illustrative of a general theme, and it goes back to that first slide. Why do commercial draftsmen not take note of a clear and consistent line of judicial decisions? Uh, this one is the fun bit, and I love talking about notices and time limits. Uh, they uh, never cease to amaze me, and it, it came uh, to my attention very early on uh, with this extraordinary case whose facts really uh, could have been set by a really nasty university tutor for law students that he really personally despised. It is, it is a horrible series of facts. Mr. Hormel uh, had sold um, a number of his shares in a company to Energy Holdings. We don't need to worry about that. There were the usual provisions to do with warranty claims and all the rest of it. All we need to know about is that if they were going to make a warranty claim, Energy Holdings had to notify that within two years of completion. And then a legal claim had to be served within one year of the service of that first notice. So we, the eye goes eagerly to the notices clause. And there it is. You can have a look through it. You can take my word for it. It's a bog standard, common or garden, notices clause. Uh, and the, the hidden subtext, if you like, is as you glance your eye through it, how many legal issues can you spot in this simple drafting? Um, there, I've underlined a few points there, and you can have a look at it, it's very simple. So it just, the first bit is pretty um, statement of the obvious. Um, communication has to be in writing, but you can hardly shout it in his face, so that's obvious. But then it says it can be maybe served by delivering it personally or sending it by prepaid recorded delivery post, okay? Then the deemed service, we've got um, deemed service for uh, uh, delivery personally. And then we have two business days um, uh, for notice sent by prepaid recorded delivery post. Okay, it seems so simple. Sort of thing, the eye would glaze over as a commercial lawyer. You wouldn't think twice about it. How much trouble can one clause cause? Um, so what actually happened? Remember, the first notice, two years within completion, that happens to be the 2nd of April. So on the 30th of March, the claimants did two things. Firstly, uh, they sent a copy by prepaid recorded delivery post. The second thing they did was dispatch a process server to Mr. Hormel's address. Now, uh, when the process server got there, uh, no one answered. I, the, the report is silent. I like to think that Mr. Hormel was wised up and he was hiding out the back in the potting shed, um, but we don't know. There was no answer, so the process server simply left a copy of the envelope in the porch outside the front door. Uh, that same day, before 5 p.m., uh, Mr. Hormel found the envelope, opened it, and read the notice and became, of course, fixed with knowledge of its contents. The, as regards the uh, postage, um, that was therefore deemed delivered two business days later. Uh, that was the 1st of April. OK, so already you can see we've got two possible dates for service of this notice. We have the 30th of March, when he actually saw the thing, or when it was left in his porch, or we've got the 1st of April, when it was posted and then deemed received. So within one year, you've got to serve a claim form. So on the 29th of March, a process server went again uh, to Mr. Hormel's address. Mr. Hormel, again, a keen gardener, was out in the potting shed, uh, didn't answer the door. So the process server knew his business, popped the envelope through the letterbox at 4.20 p.m. And the CPR provided, therefore, that the claim form was served on the 31st of March, 2011. Well, you can see the problem. If he was served on the 30th of March, they were one day late. If, they were, if he was served on the 1st of April, they were one day in time. There was everything to play for, and it went up to the Court of Appeal. Um, and the question is, uh, the code for service of the Court of Appeal was permissive. It, it used that word may. So you could have sent the letter by um, carrier pigeon. Um, you could have done it that way. 
And it could have dropped it in his back garden. And if it had happened to land on him, then that might have counted. Um, that's, that's fine. But they did say personal service has to mean personal service. I don't know whether it's still the rules for the modern CPR, but in the old days, you know, the process server had to touch the person with the writ, and then you know, even if you just dropped it, then that was still good service under the CPI, I don't, under the old rules, I don't know what happens now. But simply leaving it in the porch didn't count. However, they said you couldn't discount the fact that when he picked up the envelope on that day and read it, and became fixed with knowledge of its contents, that did count as service. So he was effectively served when he opened the envelope uh, and read it. Service by prepaid recorded delivery couldn't undo that, as it were, retrospectively. So the service was the earlier date. So the service uh, of proceedings was therefore uh, served one day late. Uh, claim struck out. It was my introduction to a whole new area of law and, and how much fun I've had with it ever since. And I want to look at three aspects of um, uh, notice clauses, uh, which uh, I find absolutely fascinating. The simple notices clause, and the longest one I've seen recently, uh, was one and a quarter pages of A4 um, typed, I think, an 11 point on a, on a commercial contract. And it had notices for all different types of uh, notices you might want to give for uh, notices have to give for problems with the project, problems with the software, problems with this, problems with that. Absolutely bizarre. Um, maybe they know something that I don't, and maybe they're on a, the lawyers were on a pay by the word uh, basis, and I was. And I've just um, uh, out of out of touch, but almost immediately that that Hormel case was then followed up because then you had to work out what does serve mean. One judge in uh, the Aegeus case said that service meant just ordinary delivery. Uh, the judge in TNL Sugar said that service meant CPR delivery. Um, those cases are still out there. You know, you can make up your mind and choose each other uh, you want. Uh, I don't like, as I always say, to make contracts longer. But if you're using a word like serve. Um, you need to define what serve means, therefore. But notices are our capricious friends. Um, Greenclose was a company, a family business, and Mr. Leach, John Leach, was its guiding force. He had to enter into a long-term hedging transaction with the NatWest, and uh, they had a right to extend it, as you can see, by giving notice uh, to Greenclose uh, by 11 a.m. London time on the 30th of December, 2011. So all eyes therefore move very eagerly to clause 12 on notices. And there it is. I mean, uh, pay by the word or what? Uh, in my day, in the good old days when things were better, um, uh, a notices clause would simply be any notice may be served by um, prepaid uh, first class post and will be deemed received two days later upon proof of postage. I remember as a young, as a young man in the good old days, I remember uh, witnessing um, a notice being put into an envelope, the stamp being affixed, uh, going to the post box on Oxford Street and coming back and writing an attendance note that I had witnessed all of these things, just in case uh, there was a thing to do with it. But here we have um, all of uh, the things. Uh, and it says that any notice um, may be given in any manner set forth in accordance with electronic messaging system details provided. Uh, see the schedule. So the eyes turn eagerly to the schedule. And it has little boxes for fax number and email address. Uh, but nobody had filled them in. The schedule was unpopulated. So it meant that out of all that, um, all that, the only way you could serve it was in person or by courier or, or by certified or registered mail. So uh, that's what uh, the judge found. So we come through to the actual day. Remember, 11 a.m. 30th December. On the 23rd of December, the bank emailed to say it intended to um, serve a notice. But of course, as we all know, saying it they intend is not the same thing as giving notice. So that that is, 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 a, is a false trail. So we come to the actual day itself, and excitement is mounting. Uh, 9.35, remember, 11 a.m. is the cutoff time. They tried to fax a notice, but the transmission failed. I like to think that Mr. Leach was stuffing paper in the fax machine at the time, <laughs> trying to stop anything coming out. But as with the Hormel case, uh, the report is silent on that. Um, so. The transmission failed. So um, 10 minutes later, they emailed, Dear John, below is a copy of a fax we tried to send to you this morning. We are informing you that the bank is exercising its right to extend the hedging contract. And then a quarter of an hour later, they obviously had some further thoughts. So they left, they rang his mobile uh, and left a voicemail. Hello there. This is a message for John Reach. Leach, it's Russell Tew calling from the NatWest. I'm just calling to say I sent you an email this morning and a fax, although we couldn't get through the fax number. Uh, Giving the bank's intention to extend your existing base rate collar, the bank will exercise that right to extend it. The details are in the email. Any questions, 
please give me a call. Well, the judge, um, perhaps slightly copping out, found as a fact that he never heard any of these things until the following day, until it was after the time had expired. Um, and she said that these notices clauses are there to provide commercial certainty for the parties. This was a mandatory clause, not a permissive one. We saw in the Hall case that it was permissive. You could serve personally or you could serve by post. You could serve by carrier pigeon as well. But this was a mandatory clause. It gave a series of, of, of steps you could take to serve a notice. Uh, and she said the only ones left, uh, given the incomplete schedule, the only ones left um, were uh, personal service, courier or post. Fax, email, they didn't cut it. So the bank had not given notice to extend the agreement. Time had gone. So at this point, when I do my updates on contract law, I, I call them um, learning points or practice points. I'm going to call these discussion points. We're all of us litigators. All of you are litigators. Um, I'm a litigator to the extent as I work as a mediator and an arbitrator as well. Um, do we talk to our commercial brothers and sisters? Do we talk to those people who draft contracts and say, when I went to UIK to a dispute only, when I was a junior associate, I said to one of my partners, oh, maybe we should you know, go out and see these corporate lawyers and tell them whether they want the drafting. And he said, hard no. Uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Very good reason. Dry up the flow of work. Yeah, exactly. They, they keep the clover. So maybe like See, I'm missing a trick here. You see, I should be on a paper word basis drafting <laughs> long notices clause. And then here, I, here we are. And I'm sort of letting the cat out of the bag with this now, aren't I? So uh, cutting off your work supply. So I've put in one case there. I, I, there are dozens, dozens of cases which I've looked at um, in the last uh, 10, 11, 12 years that I've been doing my update on contract law. But I put in these two because one was permissive while the other was mandatory. And each of them led to problems, different problems, but um, problems. What would you say to your commercial um, brothers and sisters? Would you say, draft it long, draft it short? Do you want to deal with every form of communication or just make it focus on one? Deal with every permutation. What happens if someone changes address? Leave it all open. Do you have different addresses for different types of communication? I suppose to some extent it's going to vary because if you're the likely recipient of a notice for breach or termination or whatever if in an IT contract, if you are going to be Typically, it's going to be the supplier because you're going to be the receiving the notice that you know you failed acceptance tests or whatever, or you're being terminated on. Um, maybe you want to have as long and as complicated and involved a notice clause as you possibly can draft. Maybe that was the rationale underlying that one and a quarter page monster that I had to review um, a couple of years ago. I leave it to you. But these are the questions um, about notices uh, that I would suggest that we need to be having and um, coming to a view on that. Drafting the notice, I mean, how difficult can this be? I mean, uh, all you've got to do is use ordinary English words to communicate what you want to get across. I would have thought, but uh, let's see what people can do. And um, now, uh, these are some of the cases um, which, the cases that I've been talking about in my annual update, um, I've looked through and I've dealt with a few of them as well, Ipsos, Tioco, Stobart, Stobart. I've dealt with those cases because they all have something interesting to say um, about drafting notices. Um, but there are two phrases which seem to sort of run through these things and bedevil them. And uh, one of them is when you have to give notice of a breach, uh, giving in reasonable detail. Uh, Dodica and United Luck. Uh, bang, fresh out of the Court of Appeal. Uh, we don't need to worry about the fact that it was an SBA again uh, for the trifling sum of one billion uh, US dollars, usual tax covenants and warranties. There was 100 million retained in escrow uh, pending uh, to, to make sure that no claims were made. Uh, 50 million was paid out uh, and the second tranche was to be released on the second claims escrow release date. If you wanted to make a claim before that, then uh, United Luck um, had to make any claim under the tax covenant shall only be enforceable if United Luck gives written notice to Dodica stating in reasonable detail the matter which gives rise to such claim. Ouch. This has caused so many problems. The nature of such claim and so far as reasonably practical, sorry, that's exactly a cut and paste, uh, the amount claimed in respect thereof before the second claims escrow date, the 1st of July. So they had to give notice and comply with that provision. And um, uh, what actually happened was sometime before that, 
date came up, the Slovenian tax authorities started to look at the detail of transfer pricing practices of one of the companies in the, com in the group of companies that had been solved. So um, KPMG was appointed, uh, both the uh, vendor and the purchasers representatives were involved in helping KPMG put documentation together, provide information to the tax authorities. But remember, notice had to be given by the 1st of July, 2019. So right uh, with a week to go, Clifford Chance was tasked with writing United Lux uh, notice of claims uh, under the tax covenant. Uh, and I don't know whether Taylor Wessing um, actually waited deliberately until the time had gone past, but they, about a week after the time had gone past, they wrote back to say, ha ha, uh, you uh, haven't uh, complied with the notices provision, so your claim uh, is uh, invalid. Um, remember 50 million uh, US uh, rides on this. Well, that's the key bit of the letter, uh, and uh, have, a, have a, a glance through it. And I thought quite sensationally, the trial judge said, um, that just doesn't cut the mustard. Do you have any idea why? Went up to the Court of Appeal and they said he was wrong, but uh, and what he said was, uh, this is all giving me the chronology of the investigation. You have to give me, the, in reasonable detail, the facts underlying. Uh, the investigation is the consequence of the facts underlying the matter. So just reciting um, the investigation isn't enough. Went out to the Court of Appeal, uh, and they looked at this, and they said, well, um, they said the law, which is if a contract, if a contract says that certain information must be provided, then, well, it has to be provided, and that's that. On the other hand, if um, it's talking about reasonable detail, the reasonable, they said, must depend on the circumstances, including uh, what was already known to uh, the recipient. There have been a lot of cases on this and this sort of phraseology, uh, mostly at high court level. And I have to say, this is a change because previously judges have said it's not the recipient's knowledge that's uh, relevant. It's the reasonable recipient. It's the third party. What would the third party think of all of this? Uh, and they said, well, since the recipients already knew the purpose of the tax authorities' investigation, it was okay. But to show you exactly, um, uh, the other uh, point uh, is, is, is to be aware of the claim. You have to give notice as soon as you become aware of the claim or aware of the matter. And we've had some cases on this, uh, a few cases. I've given you this one. There's another SBA. Um, uh, and they had to give notice um, as soon as reasonably practical and in any event, within 20 business days after becoming aware of the matter. And as the Court of Appeal mused, well, actually, you could become aware of the matter on three different dates. Um, you might become aware of the underlying facts without knowing that they might constitute a claim. You might become aware that there is a claim under the warranties, or you might become aware of the facts, but also be aware there was a proper basis for a claim. Um, and they, they took um, a, a narrower construction uh, and upheld the judge who thought that aware of the matter meant aware of the claim, so being fully aware not only of the facts, but of the fact that you had a basis for a claim. And they found that the notice uh, was within time. Um, very recently, uh, this case looked at the, the, the a similar form of words, basis of the claim. The judge there again said there are three different ways you could become aware of the basis of the claim. Again, we are all disputes lawyers. You are disputes lawyers. Are you telling your commercial brothers and sisters about the dangers of using these words? Um, and we certainly should be. But to get the notice absolutely right is, is, is key. And one possibility, of course, is to instruct counsel um, to get it. And that, that's one possibility, certainly. Uh, in this case, there was a lease granted to Siemens. Um, and uh, uh, the tenant uh, could determine uh, the notice by giving notice, which notice must be expressed to be given under Section 24.2 of the Landlord and Tenant Act of 1954. Now, why did it say that? Because there was a whole series of cases that provided some sort of uh, loophole in the law. And it said basically, but if you didn't uh, give this uh, notice, then you could apply for a rent view and get an extension at a, 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 at a lower rate. But that loophole was actually closed by the Court of Appeal decision back in 1996. But typical of lawyers, uh, the wording remained in the contract. Uh, and so even though this lease was uh, three years after that decision, uh, the wording was still there. And guess what? When the solicitors for Siemens came to give notice, they never mentioned section 24.2 of, um, uh, 
of the, of the, of the Landlord and Tenant Act. Is that a good notice or not? Is it, I mean, it serves no purpose, absolutely no purpose at all, um, to mention Section 24.2 because it, it's a completely false trail. So do you think that's a good notice or not? Put it to the vote. This is the Supreme Court in plenary session. Let's take a vote. Is that good enough? You think it's, who thinks it's good enough? Let's, let's, uh, there's, oh, there's, oh my goodness. Yeah, you think it's good enough? Go on. <laughs> Come on, let's, ask, let, let's ask again. We, the two brave people, let, let's show them some support. Okay, who thinks that's good enough? Substantial compliance. There's a, one in the back there. Another one. Realistic. Being realistic. And that's exactly what the judge said. He says it, 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 the, the purpose of the notice was absolutely clear. It was substantial compliance, and therefore he said it was good notice. He went to the court of appeal and said, how wrong you are. Uh, um, the question is whether the relevant event has occurred. That question has to be answered yes or no. It cannot be answered almost. Either a purported exercise of an option satisfies both the formal and substantive provisions of the clause, or it does not. If it does not, then it is ineffective. In our, my judgment, judgment, ours is such a case. The moral, clear moral is, if you want to avoid expensive litigation, and I know in this room you don't, but you know, <laughs> um, if you want, but if you did, let's just say in this hypothetical world you did, if you want to avoid expensive litigation and the possible loss of a valuable right to break, you must pay close attention to all the requirements of the clause, including the formal requirements, and follow them precisely. And as Lord Hoffman said in the, the foundational case in this area of the Manai investment uh, at, at Eagle Star, if the clause had said that the notice had to be on blue paper, it would have been no good serving a notice on pink paper, however clear it might have been that the tenant wanted to terminate uh, the lease. So discussion points, really. So if you're going to talk to your uh, commercial brothers and sisters, what do you want from a notice? Do you want it with booby traps uh, loaded in there? And the answer might be, well, if you're the likely defendant, the likely recipient of a notice, maybe you do want a, a stupid reference to Section 24.2 of the Landlord and Tenant Act, or the equivalent in the IT sector. Um, but then again, ask yourself, well, what if we are caught by the booby traps? Um, how would you like to tell your client that it's not entitled to 50 million uh, US because you wrote a letter that wasn't formally compliant with the notice provisions. I wouldn't like to be the solicitor uh, in, that, in that particular position. The first, uh, the last point I want to talk about notices is actually serving the thing. I mean, again, how difficult can this be? I mean, uh, if it says put it in the post, um, pop it in the post, uh, how difficult can this be? Zayo Group, I mean, uh, this is, is just absolutely classic. Again, a share, share purchase agreement, notices had to be served uh, for warranty claims within 18 months. On or before 5 p.m., aptly on the 30th, 13th of November, Friday the 13th. And there you can see uh, no management claim. This is what the judge described as a sue one, sue all clause. In other words, to sue any one of the vendors, you had to notify all of them. Um, so the I eagerly goes to clause 12, dealing with uh, notices uh, and provided for deemed receipt. Pretty standard, bog standard stuff. And there was a permission also to uh, give a notice for a change of address. No one had. So um, uh, we come fast forward to 13th of November, Friday the 13th, and at 1424, a motorcycle courier arrives at uh, the, the fifth defendant's, proposed defendant's uh, house, uh, clutching the letter. And a neighbor comes out and says, oh, she's emigrated to New Zealand. She wasn't being a busybody. The fifth defendant had actually emigrated to New Zealand. It was perfectly true. And the contract, of course, with this deemed service provision provided that if the motorcycle courier had popped the letter through the letterbox at 1424, it would have been deemed served on that business day. But having been told that she'd gone to New Zealand, he took the letter away with him and left it with the first defendant. And then he told um, uh, the claimant what he'd done, and they told him to get the hell back there with a letter <laughs> and to serve the, the, damn, the damn thing. But he didn't get there till quarter to uh, 10 to 8 in the evening. 5 p.m. was the cutoff time. And the, Zayo, the claimant, accepted that if they put the letter through the letter box before 5 p.m., it would have been deemed served, but they didn't do that. Uh, and the judge, again, uh, said the right to notify change of address was permissive. It wasn't mandatory. You couldn't imply a term to say that the fifth defendant had to come clean and say, I'm moving to New Zealand. Um, so um, it was simply um, not a valid service. Delivery means leaving it at the address. 
And as he said, the cases show that that's even if you know the intended recipient has moved, or even if the premises are demolished. Even if they're demolished, you just leave them at the pile of bricks <laughs> where the building was. So that is the way it is. Um, so how could, difficult can this be? I mean, should service of a notice require legal skill? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an odd thing uh, to have to ask. Is it something, in fact, that when it comes to serving a notice, you should grasp from the greedy fingers of your commercial partners and say, uh, we need to do this because uh, it's, it's a legal thing which requires litigation skill. Is litigation skill putting a stamp on an envelope and getting it, the right, getting it to the right address? Quite extraordinary. Um, but I, those are three different aspects. Three different aspects of one very simple, very boring little clause tucked away at the end of a contract, and yet it's the cause of so much grief and so much litigation. And of course, from your point of view, you're saying, well, hurrah for that, uh, and long may it, uh, may, may it carry on. And I suspect you're going to keep completely shtum about this and not tell anyone in the commercial department about, about these cases. Um, I thought I'd have a look um, next at, at a couple of others. Order of precedence clauses. Um, anyone remember this one? Anyone old enough, apart from me, to remember this? Anyone know where this comes from? Sorry? It's not the Ministry of City Works. It's not the Ministry of City Works. They didn't walk at all. Uh, any, any further guesses on where this is from? Do you remember the program? Oh, Sorry? I'm yeah. yeah, I so Cleese is upper class. John Cleese on the left there is upper class. I look down on him. Ronnie Barg with the trilby is middle class. I look up to him, but I look down on him. And Ronnie Corbett says, I am working class and I know my place. And uh, that, that was the joke. Do you remember the program it was on? It was that was the, that was the week that was TW3, which was a, a, a big thing. You can get this on YouTube if you like, if you Google for uh, this particular one. It's very funny and still very relevant. Um, but orders, order of precedence clauses, many contracts that I see have them, and they can be incredibly involved. You know, um, it's funny how the lawyers will have the front end prevailing over everything else because they don't trust anybody else to draft anything else correctly. So they say that their bit is the bit that prevails. Actually, in a sense, it's the specific that should really prevail over the general. But I leave that to you. Um, what I, I'm going to look at a couple of cases here um, and uh, ask again, get some discussion points going. RW Empire Renewables against JN Bentley. Uh, Empire against Bentley. Bentley was a subcontractor to Empire. They were building a, a hydroelectricity plant. We don't need to worry about that. The whole question was whether they had, uh, whether Bentley had achieved completion of milestones too. This was very important because if they had, uh, they would get paid. If they hadn't, they wouldn't get paid and they would have to pay out liquidated damages. Well, there's the um, troublesome clause and I've underlined uh, two of the documents, but they're in um, absolute uh, order. Uh, so they, one prevails over the others, uh, each uh, one further down in the uh, pecking order, so to speak. Uh, and these are the two documents. So that's the primary document, which is contract data. So uh, completion, including testing, blah, 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 to allow a hydro plant to be installed. Now remember, the works information was several places lower. Completion, including testing, blah, 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 to be completed to allow the hydro plant to be tested and commissioned. Well, there's a big difference between installing something and testing and commissioning it. And uh, of course, what Bentley said was they, they, they said, well, we've done enough. Um, we've done enough for it to be installed, uh, agreed it's not enough to allow it to be tested and commissioned, but we've done enough to allow it to be installed. Oh, and oh, by the way, this is to be found in the contract data that ranks first in the order of precedence. Uh, therefore, um, we have uh, a title to our money and we're not liable for liquidated damages. The judge disagreed, and so did the Court of Appeal. Uh, and the basic, the burden of their song, both of them, was to say, you look at the contract uh, as a whole, you construe it uh, as a unitary document, and you try to give, make sense of all the terms as a whole to the extent you possibly can. Uh, and the provisions, they said, um, complemented each other. And only in a clear and irreconcilable uh, case of a discrepancy would you um, resort to the contractual um, order of precedence clause. So in other words, what they were saying was, um, where it said tested and commissioned, what they really meant was installed. And where it said installed, what they meant was tested and commissioned. So um, 
it all came to the same thing. So the order of precedence clause was not engaged. This one, I think, uh, is even more um, striking. Uh, Alexander against West Bromwich. Um, Mr. Alexander had a, a buy-to-let uh, mortgage. It was a buy-to-let tracker mortgage. And uh, he was uh, signed up to the, the West Bromwich Building Society, which sent his mortgage offer through. And if you've ever had a mortgage, it comes with a big thump on the doorstep, or maybe it's served by carrier pigeon these days, I don't know, uh, or email, or it's a big, thick PDF. But it provided, in the terms and conditions, because that's a great big booklet, uh, these mortgage conditions incorporate any terms contained in the offer letter. If there are any inconsistencies between the terms and the mortgage conditions and those contained in the offer letter, then the terms in the offer letter will prevail. Okay. So that seems very simple. But if you looked at the terms and conditions, it had some fairly outrageous things. Um, it allowed West Bromwich to vary the rate, to reflect market conditions generally, to make sure its business was carried out prudently, efficiently, and competitively, whatever that meant. It also had a, a right to uh, demand repayment of the full loan on various events, including just giving one month's written notice. Um, and Mr. Alexander, um, and there are a number of people interested in getting a decision on this, said, well, this, this can't be right. The offer letter has got is, is buy to let. If it's a buy to let, I can't kick a tenant out in less than one month uh, and then just sell the property and give you all the money back. I can't do that. Um, and, I, and this thing here, I had a tracker mortgage. This isn't a tracker mortgage. If you vary it to make sure your business is carried out prudently, efficiently, and competitively, whatever that means, it ceased to be a tracker mortgage. And the Court of Appeal agreed. And they said that inconsistencies uh, weren't just a question of looking at um, an express contradiction. You have to ask whether the provisions can be sensibly read together. Um, and the offer letter contained these specific terms. It, it set out uh, the outlines of the deal that was being offered. It was for buy-to-let purposes. It was a tracker mortgage. No hint, no hint that anything else would be changed or that the West Bromwich would have the right uh, to change for anything or that the mortgage conditions provided for anything different. Uh, so uh, they said the offer letter therefore prevailed, even though there wasn't a, a technically an express contradiction between the terms. It was just the sense of the offer letter prevailed over the specific terms contained in the, in the conditions. Um, this, uh, again, is a, a very interesting case. I, I, won't have, I haven't got time to deal with it as I want to look at another issue, um, but it's, it's a fascinating case. Discussion points. Um, I've looked at several, various order of precedence clauses over the last 12 years. I haven't seen one that actually served its intended purpose. Uh, and in case of the West Bromwich case we've just looked at, it had exactly the opposite effect of what the lawyers drafting it would have intended it to have. Um, do they do any good? Are they in fact useful? When you're litigating cases, when you're girding your loins to go into battle, to what extent is an order of precedence clause a key weapon in your armory? Have you ever won a case on the basis of an order of precedence clause? I doubt it. Um, I suppose the drafting is tied to that. Well, that, that, that's, that's a good point. So the last question there is, is why do we include them? Now, I know you want the business coming out of these, but so you probably don't want to go back to your... people get, lose track of their own contracts mm -hmm. and then get tired and try to just smash them together in a coherent way. That's what they're for, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's because um, contracts have become so enormous uh, and that no one really knows any longer what, what's, what's in them. Um, and um, uh, in, in my day, again, going back and musing about when things were better, um, on, on the completion, I mean, uh, I mean on completion, you would, you would turn up early on the day and you know, MDs would turn up with posh fountain pens to do a wet ink signature, if you remember wet ink signatures, maybe not just putting a mark on a PDF, but actually writing something. And we would turn up and the contracts were set out on a trestle table and we went there armed with attendance notes and you would go through the whole text. No, there was no chance of doing a word comparison or a delta view. You had to go through every word uh, before the big wigs arrived um, and you had to check your attendance notes to make sure that all the negotiated changes had made it their way into the final draft. And what you didn't want is when you got there and the party charged 
with the draft and the printing uh, was that they said, I had to look through it overnight and I just made a few typographical amendments, you think, <laughs> because there was no red lining in those days and you had to then just go through every uh, last word. Um, but that's how it was in those days and we were more thorough uh, because of it. Now uh, we just throw in everything like including the kitchen sink into everything, you know, so we've got the requirements, the statement of requirements, the, the tender, the request for the tender, it all goes in there. And so the lawyers then think, oh my God, you know, we've got to have something that prevails. And, uh, and they just come up with uh, that clause. And it, it's to try and save the day, um, actually to save the day might, a bit of extra work, a bit more thought go into it, might help, might be more, more, more useful. Non-variation, I want to conclude uh, by looking at uh, non-variation. Uh, and, um, and you may be aware uh, of uh, the recent case, we'll look at it in just a minute, the rock advertising case. Um, I've always called them non-variation clauses and non-waiver clauses. For some reason, the Supreme Court decided to call them no oral modification or non clauses. I think it's a silly name, but that's only me. I still call them non-variation clauses. Um, and of course, the uh, point about them was, uh, was that just as you could waive the non-waiver clause, you could vary the non-variation clause. I mean, it was, uh, it was as simple as that. And so as lawyers, we put these things in because we knew they were useless. Um, because uh, we knew we, we wouldn't get into trouble because if we put them in, because it was in the template, therefore, you know, we'd be saving our own careers by putting them in. But we all knew at the back of our minds, indeed at the front of our minds, that if, if, if it came to a ruck, um, you could actually uh, vary these things anyway without the formality of a variation. And we had a whole series of cases, right following one after the other, uh, quite extraordinary. And the first one was this Viralite case, where the judge mused, saying, well, there's no actual direct authority on the efficacy or inefficacy of non-variation clauses, but it came up for direct decision in that case. Uh, it was a distribution agreement for pharmaceutical, for a pharmaceutical uh, product to be sold to consumers. We don't need to worry about the facts. Um, there were delays in getting the drug um, to a satisfactory state, getting FDA approval, that sort of thing. Um, and therefore there was uh, agreement by email to postpone certain payments. And as you can see there, reference to writing includes facts and similar modes. Uh, daily and ongoing correspondence can be carried out via email. Any modifications of this agreement or any material, or material alteration of the relationship must be in written and executed form, not including email or fax. And the funny thing is, whilst I'm quite keen of my emphasis added, and that's what I've done for all uh, the cases of underlining so far, the original contract said, underlined, not including uh, email or fax. So guess what they did? They varied, they all purported to vary the thing, uh, by email, and there were uh, various emails um, uh, postponing payments and uh, varying the agreement, or purporting uh, to uh, vary uh, the agreement. Well, was that a valid variation uh, of the agreement, notwithstanding those specific underlined words? And the judge um, sucked air through his teeth, and what with, with little authority there was on it, and he said, well, each case is fact sensitive, and you have to look at it, and you, you could take into account certain things like whether the, the precision of the wording, whether the wording was specifically negotiated or insisted on by one party. But he took the line that most of us thought that judges would take, and he said, well, the evidence showed that the parties intended to vary the thing, and if they intended to vary it, then they intended to vary the non-variation clause, just as you can waive the non-waiver clause, you can waive reliance on the non-waiver clause. Um, and so that was how it went through until we came up to this case, uh, a rock advertising that went up to the Supreme Court because at the Court of Appeal, they, they followed exactly that line. Um, rock advertising was behind in its payment of rent. They orally agreed with MWB's credit controller a schedule of, of repayments. And when her boss saw that, he said, not likely, uh, and uh, locked them out of the premises and terminated uh, their license. But there is um, the... Typical wording, all variations, must be agreed, set out in writing, and signed on behalf of both parties before they take effect. Well, this was oral. Could that mean that it took effect a la virulite? Could it mean that it took effect notwithstanding uh, that particular specific provision? Uh, the Supreme Court, by a majority four to one, said uh, contracts are all about commercial certainty. Uh, and Lord Sumption, giving uh, the, the leading judgment, uh, set out three reasons why commercial certainty uh, in these cases uh, was absolutely essential. And the only way around it uh, was a, a stopple. But even there, a stopple can't be so broad to, so as to make inroads to destroy the advantage of the certainty 
of a no oral modification clause. And I remember saying at the time, this is going to cause trouble. Uh, and I was right. Um, it is causing trouble. And we've had a rash of cases recently uh, looking at uh, exactly the legal problems that this quest for certainty is giving rise to. Um, it was, it's been followed. And immediately, it was followed. Um, I won't look at that case. I'm going to look at this one. Um, advanced multi-technology against uh, Uniserv, um, manufacturer of medical supplies. This was all to do with a contract for the supply of face masks. Why would anyone want a face mask these days? You might well ask, but there we are. This was back in April 2020. Uh, and uh, advanced uh, was, I think, Jordanian based, and they were going to supply 80 million uh, masks. There was a dispute about the facts. We don't need to worry about that. And advanced said, well, it couldn't make some deliveries because it had a problem with some of the machinery. Um, but have a look at the um, change control there. Any change to the goods or other variations shall only be binding once it has been agreed in writing uh, and signed by an authorized representative of both parties. Now, uh, you're all legal eagles. And just before we break up for the evening and go for drinks, how many legal concepts can you see open for dispute in those two lines of text? <laughs> in the old days, it was quite simple. You know, it was just, well, did they vary? Did they intend to vary it? Well, you know, okay, they vary the non-variation clause. Think of the old sort of arguments that you're going to come up now. It wasn't done. Um, uh, in, in writing, as usual, done by exchange of emails. That's the way people do these things. Have any, any sort of legal concepts you can think um, that you might want to argue about there? Well, who's an authorized representative, for one thing? That's one thing, isn't it? Because the contract had a boxes for people who are supposed to be recipients of communications. They weren't the people who signed off these emails. And in fact, one of the emails was signed by an agent acting a separate company, um, acting for the other one. Were they an authorized representative? Uh, and the judge, it was a deputy judge, uh, and she picked her way through it. And, um, uh, and she decided uh, that uh, she had to look uh, at the question of who is an authorized representative. Um, and if you look at the, the form, and she said it's um, uh, you can see authorized only is not capitalized letters. So she said that's not a defined term. Therefore, it could be anyone who happens to be authorized uh, to sign off a, a variation. Um, but then uh, get more provisions. Um, this is a, a non-waiver clause, which the judge uh, assumed, therefore benefited or had the disadvantage of the Supreme Court's uh, uh, quest for certainty deriving from uh, rock advertising. So can you find any sort of written waiver as well? Oh, my goodness. Um, uh, yeah, I know. It's, it's an upgrade opportunity. I think I said last time, Sam. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, but then it brought in questions of, therefore, waiver. Uh, and with it, affirmation of the contract, because we're talking here about um, uh, a repudiatory, an alleged repudiatory breach. So was that an affirmation? Uh, did it count as affirmation? You could add into there to the uh, poisonous, toxic cocktail uh, questions to do, therefore, with a stopple as well. Uh, I could think of collateral contract, perhaps, or implied contract. Um, what used to be a very simple argument has now become, well, a bean feast for you uh, litigation uh, lawyers. I don't think it has achieved um, certainty in the, the operation of commercial contracts. Uh, not at all. So that the radical question, a heterodox question for discussion points, and I know you're not going to say this to your commercial brothers and sisters, you say, do we need these clauses any longer? We only put them in in the old days because we knew they didn't mean anything. Um, now they most certainly do mean something, and it means that you guys are going to be feasting on the dripping roast that represents an argument <laughs> about an exchange of emails. Um, should we actually start dropping these clauses now? It's completely left a field, but maybe that's going to cause more harm than good. It's quite striking uh, how, since the rock advertising case, we're getting more and more cases through now uh, dealing with um, this question of whether a change uh, is effective or not for want of writing or signature or other formal uh, requirement in the contract. And the reality is, um, and you can look at that again as the, the slide I flashed up right at the beginning, 
Um, and the reality is, if you're an MD or a CEO or whatever, and you're tasked with writing a notice or doing a variation, the likelihood of you going to clause 67, clause 2, little Roman 3, and getting the notice right and the form of the variation right are about as close to zero as make no appreciable difference. Um, so do we, need, we need to think about all of these things. And I think we should be speaking to uh, our commercial lawyers, and I think we should be talking about better contracts. But anyway, that's all I was going to say today, so thank you very much. Thank you.